I think we left off here. This is a, what, what's going on here is this is interrogation going on. What's an interrogation? In everyday life, what, what is, if, if you're being interrogated, what's happening to you? Abby? Yeah, you're being questioned, and usually the questions are more direct, and you're kind of put on the spot. Uh, Miles? Are you being questioned because you've been accused of something? You've been accused of something usually, yeah. There, there's something going on that's on the more serious level. So it's not like, how are you kind of questions. Like, do you like flowers? Um, do you like to eat bananas? Like, it's not like opinion-based questions. These are questions that are direct and have to do with uh, a more serious issue. That's exactly what's going on here. So as you look at the story here, who has sent, who sends who to interrogate John? Who's sending who? Miles? The Pharisees sent the priests and um, Levites. Levites, yep. Levites. Excellent, yep. The priests and Levites. So what you have here as a quick, quick review, again, you're like, well, how does this relate to my life? I, I'm going to get there in a second. What's going on is John the Baptist is being targeted because he is not part of the Pharisaical church. There's a church in Jesus' day. It's called the temple. It's what really the temple. It, that's what's, that, it's a Jewish church. It's called the temple, and the Pharisees are the ones who rule that, that church. And what's happening is they're getting word that someone named John is out in the desert somewhere, and he's teaching people and he's baptizing people and he's not part of the grand church and the Pharisees are like who are you like who is this person that's doing religious activity and is not one of us that's where the, the bottom line who does this person think he is that's what's going on here the Pharisees are like who do you think you are John to be teaching about God and to be baptizing and you're not part of our church so they send agents out essentially to interrogate him. That's why you should think of this. That's what's going on here. And they ask him a bunch of questions. Are you the Messiah? Nope. Are you Elijah? Nope. Remember who Elijah is? Never dies. never dies in the Old Testament. So if he never dies, they think that he might be coming back at some point. They wonder if John is that person who's kind of come back from heaven, right? He says, no, also, remember Elijah, you might be aware of this story as well. Elijah's the one who had enough confidence and belief in God to call upon God for it not to rain, and it didn't rain for a season. Think about that for a second. Elijah, a man, a human being, has enough confidence in God to call upon God for him to change the weather. That's exactly why we do it in this class, by the way. So it's the acknowledgement that God's real. He's in control of the weather. So Elijah called upon God for it not to rain. It didn't rain. He's a, he's a godly man. And he never died. And everyone knows who he is. And they ask him, are you Elijah? That important figure? Nope, I'm not Elijah. Are you the prophet? Capital P. Moses taught about this figure, like the prophet of prophets. Like this guy who'd have uh, the ability to say and do things that are pretty kind of crazy or supernatural even. And he's the, they're asking, are you this person? The, the underlying question he's after is, or that they're after, is whose authority are you doing these things? Like, who do you think you are, John, to baptize and to teach about God and not be part of our church? And it leads to this, this one line here at the bottom, which is, I think, where we left off. He quotes this line from this verse in the Old Testament. Can anyone look this up? Anyone look this verse up? Oh, you mean the verse inside? Uh, I'm catching students who are playing games and on, on videos and watching like sports and stuff. If I catch you, I will take your iPad and I will give it to Miss Slater. Okay. So if you're on your iPad, it's an honor system. Okay. You're on the Bible or nothing. Okay. Uh, can I get a volunteer to read this verse? Isaiah 40, verse 3. Abby, thank you. Okay. Um, you, might, you may or may not catch the meaning here. What, what Isaiah is saying, this is the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah in the Old Testament was, to paraphrase it, 
was essentially saying uh, that he wanted to essentially create opportunities for people to connect with God. That's Isaiah in the Old Testament. I'm paraphrasing that. But that's the, all that language there is, is the talk of trying to get you to see, people to see, that God's available to be experienced, but um, something that, that all of us kind of have a role to play in experiencing God's presence. So I'll get to that in a second. John's saying, in response to who do you think you are, John, John says he quotes this line that Isaiah said from the Old Testament. And what he's saying indirectly, John is saying here, is that the Messiah has come, and my role is a role given to me by God. You're asking me who my, where my authority is coming to baptize? They ask him this question here. Why are you baptizing, John? And he's saying, I'm under God's authority to do what I'm doing, to say what I'm saying. And part of my mission is to make straight the way for the Lord. What in the world does that mean? He's saying, my God-given role is to create opportunities to let people know that God's available and that they uh, have to prepare themselves to receive from God or experience God. Now let me ask this question. This might sound weird or strange, uh, this whole conversation here, but this is very practical because are you guys aware of how, how you experience God's presence? Like if I asked you, like, how is it that any of you can experience God's presence? What do you need to do? What would your response be if I asked you, what do you need to do as an individual to experience God's presence? There is a biblical answer, which is what John's getting to here. What is your role or responsibility in experiencing God's presence? <clears throat> what do you need to do? It's not a trick question. It's maybe just asked in a different way. You, I think you guys know, you probably know the answer to this question. What would be required of you to experience God's presence? Any guesses? It's a biblical answer. Uh, Braden? Read the Bible. Read the Bible? You can read the Bible and not be a believer, though. So you can read the Bible and not believe it. So that in and of itself may not get to do anything for you. Um, I, if you're a believer and you're reading the Bible, yes. But how, the, the question is, how do you get to a point where you can receive from the Bible? Like, how can you experience God's presence is what we're after, Abby? Pray, what would you pray? I mean, I'm trying to get specific here because I want to make sure you get this. This is extremely relevant, you guys. How do you experience God's presence? Yes, pray. Yes, read the Bible. But it's something more specific than that. I'm saying to you that you can read the Bible and not get anything from it because maybe you don't believe it. So it's not just reading the Bible. You can also pray and maybe not experience anything. It depends. In order to connect with God, I'm, what I'm asking you, in order to connect with God, what would be necessary of you first? It's a biblical answer. I think that maybe it's possible you may be overthinking it. What would be necessary to experience God's presence? Let me ask you this question. How do you get to heaven? Same kind of question. Steph? Believing is part of it. So that's part of it, the equation you believe. I'm asking you, how would you make your way straight to the Lord? What is John talking about here? He's talking about you connecting with God. How do you connect with God? You believe. There's something that usually comes before belief. Repent and believe. And we've talked about, I think we've talked about this before, but the idea, what John's after here is, I have been sent by God to make a way, to pave a way, to show people how to connect with God. How do you connect with God? Repent of your sins and believe. And this is the same back, it was the same back in Jesus' day, John's day, as it is today. It's the same thing. You want to connect with God? Do you want to have a real experience with God? It requires something of you. Repent of your sins and place your confidence in him. That's what we're talking about. You're saying to God, I am a sinner. I've messed up. I'm openly talking about it. I'm openly confessing it. I am guilty and I'm sorry, like genuinely sorry about it. Again, sin takes different forms. We've already talked about this in the past. Lying, cheating, disrespecting your parents, being lazy, having idols, sleeping around, doing drugs. It could be a bunch of other things, right? 
you know what your sins are. I don't need to know. Like, I'm, I'm not here to call anyone out. But you know what your sins are. The idea would be, if you want to experience God, it's not okay. You need to repent of your sin. And then you say to God, I am genuinely sorry. Help me be the person you want me to be. I believe that you are exactly who you say you are. I believe that you're alive. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you're here for me. I believe that you paid the price for me to get to heaven. That's how you experience God. What John's saying here is, I'm a, I've been sent by God to essentially make the way for people to experience this Messiah, Jesus. How do you do that? Repent and believe. God's presence isn't just going to fall on you guys. Like You have a role to play is the point there. Like You have to make a conscious decision to ask God for forgiveness and to put your confidence in him. If you do that, you will experience God's presence. That's what I'm saying to you. If you don't do that, you won't experience God's presence. If you don't repent and you don't believe, you're cutting yourself off from God's presence. So there's an equation if you're a math person. There's an equation to get to God's presence. It's repent and plus, repent plus believe, faith, trust, confidence equals God's presence. But you have a role to play. And John's, John's saying that, that's what he's saying here. I have come to teach people how to connect with God, to make a way, to make a path for them to experience God's presence. And you're going to notice what he says when he preaches. He's going to say, repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. It's the same message that's never changed. It's the same today as it was back then. Okay? So let me focus then on, they ask him, How, why are you doing this? Why are you teaching? Okay? Whose authority are you operating under? He says, essentially, God. And then they ask him, why are you baptizing? Okay? He says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Let's focus on this right here. This one statement may sound strange or odd or, I don't know, weird, confusing. But what do you think he's, John means by saying this? He's talking about Jesus. What would you guess or what do you know about this statement here? What is he saying? What do you think he's saying here? He says... Jesus is the one who comes after me. We've already talked to you. I mentioned that. You remember verse right? He comes after me, but he's greater than me, right? He comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Why is he talking about feet all of a sudden? Why is he talking about footwear? What, what is he saying? Guesses? Or maybe you know? Sierra? Those were the sandals that Jesus wore as he was on the Good guess. Even the sandals that Jesus wears has more value than him. That's a really good guess. That's not exactly what he means here, but that's really that's good thought there. What what it's I think it's close. Any other guesses as to what he's talking about? What what do you mean by this? Any other guesses? Maybe you know. So part of what Sierra is getting at there is, is accurate. Let me just fill you in with the background information, okay, really quickly. The historical context helps you understand what he's saying here. You couldn't possibly know this by just reading the Bible. But let me tell you what, in that day, in that world, okay, um, just think about this for a second. Uh, most people don't have shoes back in that day. If they do have shoes, they're really, really thin. Like, we would look at them and say, like, you consider these sandals? Like, they're nothing even close to what we wear today. Nothing even close. On top of that fact, do you realize that most people in Jesus' day are walking, and we're going to see this in the Gospel of John, they're walking really, really far distances. So they don't have shoes or sandals. If they do have sandals, they're really, really thin. On top of that, they're walking everywhere. Think about this for a second. What kind of condition would your feet be in if you're walking all over the place and you have no shoes or very, very poor sandals? What kind of condition are your feet going to be in? Really bad. Like what specifically? Athlete's foot. Athlete's foot. Crusty. Crusty. <laughs> <laughs> it is gross. But this is part of the, this is this is kind of built into the idea here for a second. The idea is 
that in, when John says this, you should know that in Jesus' day, not even the lowest ranked person, that usually they're called slaves in that day, not even slaves, the, the people who have no rights and no opinions, who are basically servants of everybody, not even the slaves in Jesus' day would take or untie sandals. They would, even the slaves wouldn't touch the feet. Even the slaves wouldn't take the sandals off. So with that information, what do you, what do you see here? If the lowest person in their society, literally um, slavery in the America and slavery in the Bible are two different concepts. So what we think of in slavery, we think of like Civil War days. And all. It's not exactly like that in biblical days. It's not that extreme. But the idea would be that in Jesus' day, there were people who were essentially servants and what I'm saying to you is not even the lowest ranked person in that society would unstrap people's sandals, would take the sandals off. They wouldn't even go near it, not even the lowest ranked person. So what is John saying here? What is he saying? What does he mean? Guesses? The straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He's essentially saying that compared to Jesus, I'm less than a slave. Compared to Jesus, I'm not even I'm not even a slave level. Right? I wouldn't even do something. I'm not worthy to do something that a slave, not even a slave, wouldn't do. The idea would be that Jesus is extremely high and lifted up. I I I'm not even worthy to untie his his sandals. Right. The lowest, the wor one of the worst things that anyone could do in that society, one of the most disgusting things anyone could do in that society, he would say, I'm not even worthy to do the lowest thing that not even slaves would do. The point would be that Jesus is extremely high and lifted up um, in comparison to him, right? And this is another example of the, the language that John uses to paint this picture that Jesus is like glorious, that he is beyond amazing, that he is genu genuinely worthy of like being in awe of, right? And all, all this language points to that idea. So John's deferring, John's not being close to claiming he's a Messiah, John is saying stuff like, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals, right? This all points to his very, very, very high view of Jesus, okay? Let me move on for the sake of time. Verse 29, <clears throat> notice this is the first like encounter that John has with Jesus uh, with his eyes. Like The next day, after he said that to the Pharisees, it says the next day John saw Jesus with his own eyes coming toward him. And look at his words. If you didn't know what he was talking about here, you'd think, man, John, you're weird. Because look at what he says. <clears throat> Jesus is coming toward him, walking physically toward him. And John's <laughs> John says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay, thanks, John. That, that's weird language. What is he talking about? What is, what is John saying? What does he mean here? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Can you, can you say that another way? What does John actually mean here? Sarah? He is the Son of God. What does the Son of God do? What, is this, what would this mean? He's taking away the sins of the world. And what does that mean for you? If, if, he's, if he's taking your sins away, what practical result, what, what results practically? Yeah. Heaven? Did you say heaven? Yeah. Yeah, it's, what, what happens in heaven? You're right. If, I'm trying to get deep and specific on this. In heaven, guys, it, it's God's presence. So, yes, you're right. The idea, what he's saying here, guys, is, Look, the Lamb of God. Lamb of God is the idea that the sacrifice of God, the lambs were often sacrificed in that day. Why? We've already talked about this. They were sacrificed to pay for sins. They made people right with God. The picture that John's painting is, here comes the one who can take away your sins. The idea would be that this is the individual, guys. Look, the individual who's coming to connect us with God. 
He's coming to make us, help us to experience God's presence, right? How does he do that? He takes away our sins. By taking away your sins, you can, you can connect with God. This, this is why you need to repent, guys. This is repentance and forgiveness. The reason you need to repent and forgive and receive forgiveness is because sin always separates you from God. It always, this, this is the effect it always has. It always has, it always will, it always, it's, just a, it's always a thing, right? So the more you sin, the more God's going to feel distant. The less you sin, the closer God's going to feel. So if you feel distant from God, one of my first questions would be, is there, I don't, what, have you received forgiveness for your sins? If the answer is no, then yeah, you feel distant from God because sin separates you from God. What John's saying is, here comes the individual, the one who's going to take your sins away so that you can experience God's presence. And it's this powerful statement. Let me quickly go on to the next idea here. I'm skipping a bunch of stuff, but I want to make sure I get some of the highlights here. He repeats that same line the very next day, guys. So he's repeating this. The next day, he says the same thing. And then it goes into this conversation about the first followers, there's dialogue, okay? I want to focus on a couple here. One is right here. Look at Jesus' first reaction when he encounters Peter. It might seem like nothing, right? But if you understand what's going on here, Jesus sees Peter and says, you're Simon, son of John, you'll be called Cephas. This word right here, guys, means rock. The first time that Jesus sees Peter, he calls, he changes his name. He calls him Cephas, which means, in that day, rock. How is Peter like a rock? If you know his story, how is Peter like a rock? Okay, there's a negative side to it. That's not what Jesus means here, but he's hard to move, I guess you could say. He's stubborn. In a positive sense, how is Peter like a rock? Describe a rock. How would you characterize a rock? Solid. Hard. Solid. Hard. Hard. <laughs> foundational. I mean, you, you need, the idea would be that in a sense that Peter is the foundation by which the church is built. That's kind of what he means here. You, you, it's, it's a firm foundation. The idea is it's, it's positive. The first encounter that Jesus has with Peter is positive. And what I'm saying is Jesus knows that Jesus knows everything. He knows Peter's mistakes. He knows that Peter's hard-headed. He, but the, the point would be that he's changing his name because he's going to change his life. He's going to change his life. He's going to be the leader, the rock-solid, firm foundation of the church. That's what kind of built into that idea. The same thing goes, the same kind of interaction happens with Jesus and Nathaniel. Um, I have one minute to say this, but... Nathaniel has some kind of racist issue going on here. Nathaniel says, once he finds out that Jesus is from Nazareth, he's like, Nazareth? What good can come from Nazareth? There's, a, there's something going on in Nathaniel's heart that's not right, whether it's racism or superiority. When Jesus encounters Nathaniel, he focuses on the positive. When Jesus sees you, he knows your weaknesses, but he focuses on the positive. Right? We have that backwards, usually. 